The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marcia Alvar. Do not get involved. Keep a stiff upper lip and always take notes. Those are just a few of the rules that guide the work of Pulitzer Prize winning crime writer Edna Buchanan. Another rule, Never Let Them See You Cry, serves as the title of her newest collection of stories based on the murder and mayhem she covered as a reporter for the Miami Herald. And welcome. To upon reflection. Thank you. To give us some kind of frame of reference for what you did so many years as a reporter, how many murders would you say you covered? Oh, I've covered about 5,000 violent deaths, about 3,000 of the murders. And what drew you to this beat in the first place? Why did you want to cover crime? I'll be unlike a lot of young reporters who think it's the entry-level beat they should try to escape as soon as possible, it really can be the best beat on the newspaper because of the people's stories. You know, it's the nitty-gritty, what makes people become heroes or homicidal maniacs, what brings out the best in them or, or drives them berserk. And a writer couldn't have more. It's all there. Greed, sex, comedy, tragedy, violence. As you said, that, I mean, this is a beat that really burns out most people who work on it. You may have some kind of record for longevity for covering murder and, and crime. What has, has kept you at it? I mean, there must have been moments where you've thought, I just don't think I can do this anymore. Oh, I think that it, it's a joy. The reason, it's, it's just, it's so exciting to come to work every day because we're among the last people in the world who can accomplish something. You know, there's, the world is so f full of bureaucratic red tape and social agencies that don't respond. I mean, have you tried to call Social Security or someplace like that recently? All you get is voicemail. And a story in the newspaper can cut through red tape like a razor. We can be a crime victim's best friend. We can accomplish things. We can help justice to triumph in cases where it would never triumph otherwise. That sounds a bit like a, a crusader, and it, and it seems to go against one of the rules I mentioned, which is do not get involved. Well, it can make you feel like Superwoman or Superman to the rescue, <laughs> because you know that the good readers will respond. All you have to do is just tell them the facts, and they'll take it from there. And they will give victims donations of money or time or blood or vital organs if they need them, and sometimes you can even win them justice because it is a brutal fact of life and death in American cities that cases with media attention are better covered but covered by the police, better investigated, they find the overtime somehow, they find the manpower, they're better prosecuted, judges are far less likely to make a deal, and sometimes there is justice, which is pretty rare in our system. Uh, give uh, one of the, the many examples that you have in the book of, of those moments where the public really rallied to the side of someone because of a story you did. Oh, there have been so many, but there was one. I walked into a police station one day, and there was this little tiny widow sitting there, an elderly South Beach senior citizen, weeping and saying, I want to die, I have no place to go. She'd been evicted by her landlord because her Social Security check was late. And he was one of these really awful landlords. He'd put her out on the street. He'd had a deputy come, change the locks on her door. All she had was a dollar bill and a little bag with her heart medicine and some hairpins in it. And she was weeping, and it was, the sat it was Saturday, the day before Mother's Day. And so these two police officers were trying to help her, but it was next to impossible. So if, and all she had on were these little house slippers. She didn't have shoes, and she was so embarrassed. So I wrote the story the next day, and of course, you know what happened. It was a wonderful, the best Mother's Day I ever had, because the readers came to visit her. She was offered a place to stay, a nice little South Beach Coaster hotel where she'd have three square meals. They brought her flowers. They brought her perfume. They brought her little dresses. And uh, she had a great meal that day. And it was the first time since 1946 when her husband died and her only son was killed in 45 in the Navy. It was the first time she'd even had a Mother's Day since then. And I knew the readers would come through. All you have to do is write the story, and they will. She it was works. a wonderful person in that she was so self-reliant. It, it, it had really been hard for her to find herself in, in that position, and she hated the idea of charity. Oh, this, this was another woman, Rose Bennett. She was an elderly widow 
who had been uh, brutalized in her own home. Her, she was the widow of a military man, and she had been attacked and brutalized in her own little bungalow in Miami three or four times within three or four weeks. She'd been tied up and beaten, and when I wrote her story, the readers responded. They came and secured her house, put on good locks, boarded up the broken windows. Uh, people were bringing her gifts of food. I found that she was getting no pension, and she was foraging in the garbage cans behind the supermarket for food. She was doing little odd jobs. She was 82, I think. And when people responded and were helping her, she was embarrassed, saying, I want to be self-reliant. You shouldn't take something for nothing. People should keep this. They might need it themselves. I mean, she was like one of the true heroes. It doesn't take, you know, being a Rambo type to make you a hero. Sometimes just surviving is heroic. Sometimes the, the way the public rallies, though, takes a surprise turn. And I was thinking of the story of the young man who the public rallied. He was put into a fancy hotel, but somehow that one didn't have quite the same happy ending. Right. He broke up uh, supposedly a robbery. A woman was being robbed at gunpoint. He broke it up, and he was wounded in the neck by the gunman. If it had been a fraction of an inch further over, it would have severed his jugular vein. He would have been killed. Uh, she went to the hospital by his side. There was a, I didn't write that original story, but there was a picture in the paper, and he was featured as a hero, given a few free days at a Miami Beach hotel. He was just a drifter, a homeless young man who, who looking for a job had no money, looking for Chicago. a job. People offered him jobs. People offered him places to stay. And the next thing we knew, he was back in Chicago under arrest for being a burglar and going to jail. And it was interesting because the woman, then the police were even inferring, well, maybe he had a part in that robbery. He didn't really try to break it up. But the little woman that he saved was saying she still believed in heroes, even though he sort of turned out to be an, a non-hero, basically. How has, uh, how has your beat changed since you started? Is murder different now in Miami than when you first started covering it? Um, we had more ruthless murders, I guess, with the influx of the Mariel refugees, you know, where Castro flushed his toilets on Miami, and we had some of the most ruthless, terrible criminals in the world. I mean, it would be nice if we could take death row, all our maximum security prisons, and our hospitals for the deranged, criminally insane, and send all those people somewhere to get them off our hands, and that's exactly what Castro did to us. So we saw a f many more motiveless, just ruthless killings, and of course, there are many more drug killings now. I think the big cocaine wars between the Cubans and the Colombians have simmered down. They've realized it wasn't good public relations to have gunfights in parking lots in broad daylight. But um, it's changed in the respect, I guess, that when I got there, Miami Beach was a sleepy resort city. When we did have crime, it was bizarre, but there wasn't that much. Now it's a major international cosmopolitan capital. And of course, the crimes are still bizarre. You know, we're way down there at the bottom of the map people on the run from their own personal demons or from the law or from each other drift in that direction. Then, of course, we had the big influx from the South, people running from dictators and poverty and wars. And they all sort of meet up in Miami, and the full moon comes out, and the barometric pressure drops, and things go crazy. And I love it. It's a great place to be a writer. Social scientists have also speculated on the notion that because we are inundated with violence, particularly in pop culture, in films and on television, that we've gotten kind of immune to violence and that it has become a factor in the number of crimes that are I'm committed. I'm convinced that's true. I've seen cases where kids saw a crime on TV or in a TV movie or TV show the night before and have gone out and committed it where it never would have occurred to them otherwise. I think some sex crimes originate in that way also. And of course, as a writer, you can't support censorship. And yet, on the other hand, I think the people in the entertainment world who are responsible for these things ought to use judgment and, and more responsibility. And I think parents also ought to take more responsibility for what their children are watching, uh, not use the TV as a babysitter. I think the breakdown of the family unit and a lack of responsibility, because you know a lot of the violence we see on television and in movies and even in some books is gratuitous. It doesn't have to be there. It's just for shock value, shock effect. I think uh, the rape scene that they seem to have to have in every major you know, action picture isn't always necessary. Another of the, the statistics that I read particularly surprised me about Miami, and that, and that is the, the number of murders that are solved, and that at one point, not that long ago, that the, the solution rate the, the was about 80 percent, and that now it's about 40 percent. Right. Why are so many fewer murders ever solved? I think because we have, you know, traditionally, the person most likely to murder you is 
the person that uh, sits across the breakfast table from you or sleeps on the pillow next to you and has their name on your checking account, uh, you're in more danger at home than you are out on the street you know, with some sinister stranger lurking in the shadows. But we're having more strangers kill strangers. You know, People come from Toronto or from Seattle down to Miami to make a dope deal. They don't file their itinerary with uh, their family and it doesn't work out. They're in over their head. They wind up getting murdered, ripped off, and dumped out in the Everglades. And the first problem the police have is identifying the corpse. If you can't identify that corpse and you don't know who got murdered, how are you ever going to find who killed them? Because the thing you always do, a good homicide detective will go out and interview the friends, the relatives, the neighbors, the co-workers, the friends and enemies of the victim. And if they don't know who the victim is, where do they start? So I think it's a lot of these drug murders are among strangers and it's pretty tough to solve a case if you don't even know who got killed. So it's all this rootlessness and mobility and people just drifting through and moving from place right. to place. Right, exactly. I don't know of very many writers who, uh, who have had other writers write stories about their writing, um, but Calvin Trillin wrote a piece called Covering the Cops and, and wrote a piece about a fairly distinctive writing style that you have. And, uh, when he was on this program, we had him read a, a section of that story. We're going to just take a look at that right now. In the newsroom of the Miami Herald, there is some disagreement about which of Edna Buchanan's first paragraphs stands as the classic Edna lead. I line up with the fried chicken faction. The fried chicken story was about a rowdy ex-con named Gary Robinson, who late one Sunday night lurched drunkenly into a church's outlet shoved his way to the front of the line and ordered a three-piece box of fried chicken. Persuaded to wait his turn, he reached the counter again five or ten minutes later, only to be told the churches had run out of fried chicken. The young woman at the counter suggested that he might like chicken nuggets instead. Robinson responded to the suggestion by slugging her in the head. That set off a chain of events that ended with Robinson's being shot dead by a security guard. Edna Buchanan covered the killing for the Herald. There are policemen in Miami who say that it wouldn't be a killing without her. And her story began with what the fried chicken faction still regards as the classic Edna lead. Gary Robinson died hungry. All connoisseurs would agree, I think, that the classic Edna lead would have to include one staple of crime reporting, a simple matter-of-fact statement that registers with a jolt. The question is where the jolt should be. There's a lot to be said for starting right out with it. I'm rather partial to the Edna lead on a story last year about a woman about to go on trial for a murder conspiracy. Bad things happen to the husbands of Widow Elkin. Calvin Trillin reading uh, from his essay, Covering the Cops, an essay he wrote about Edna Buchanan. It must be very odd to see yourself translated through somebody else's eyes. I mean, are you comfortable with being the subject of the story? Yeah, at the time when, they, when Calvin Trillin wanted to do the profile of me, I was very uncomfortable because I'd been interviewing people all my life and I was very uncomfortable that somebody was about to do it to me, but, <laughs> but it worked out okay. He's a wonderful writer. And it made me realize a lot about being on the other side of, of the typewriter. <laughs> Well, I guess everybody gets to pick their favorite uh, Edna lines, and I wanted to, to just quickly read mine. Treacherous rip current spawned by heavy winds drowned three tourists and left a fourth in critical condition one day. They had all ignored warnings. One was told personally by lifeguards that it was too dangerous to venture into the water. He insisted that he had gone swimming every morning for ten days and had no intention of disrupting his routine. His body washed up a short time later, disrupting his routine permanently. How did you develop this style? What, where does it come from? Um, I'm not sure. I guess every writer has their own style. I know when it came to the leads, um, in fact, The Corpse Had a Familiar Face, which was the book, be, you know, the nonfiction book before this one, The Corpse Had a Familiar Face, the title was a lead I had used on a story for the Herald. And in my novel that was published uh, about a year or two ago, and it's just out in paperback, Nobody Lives Forever, the first line of that book was a lead I used on a story. It was the night of the full moon over Miami. The shooting started early. And I think years and years ago, when I first started out as a reporter, I read a story that said that most readers, when the story jumps to another page, don't jump with it. 
they just don't go on, they don't finish the story. And I was shocked because the whole joy of this business is communicating with your reader and to think that they wouldn't finish the story. So I always tried to write in a way that would get them rolling along that they couldn't stop, they would have to finish the story. In his piece about you, Trillin mentioned that, that it, there may have been the tabloids playing a role in this, that you were fond of reading them when you were a young girl growing up in New Jersey. Yeah, I, start, I learned to read on the New York Daily News. And I used to read uh, the, the Mira years ago. A lot of those good papers are gone for good now. But uh, I loved it. I, I learned to read, uh, you know, reading the adventures and the misadventures of Willie Sutton and George Metesky, the Mad Bomber, and all. These were sort of the dark princes of my childhood. Other people were reading about Pinocchio, and I was reading about the Mad Bomber. And I always loved stories. And from the time I was four years old, I knew I was a writer. And I couldn't read yet, but I was telling people that when I grew up, I was going to write books. And fiction was what I really had in mind. And I'm really blessed because finally at this late date, I'm getting to do what I always wanted. And very few of us get to do that. If we did, there'd be more cowboys and Indians and firemen and policemen. So I'm really lucky. There's a, a kind of flukiness about the way you got into to reporting, too. I mean, you didn't go to journalism school, right. didn't go to college. Which probably helped me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, you didn't learn all the wrong ways to cover us. I story. never went to college. I never went to journalism school, except last term I taught a class at FIU. But that's the closest I've been to journalism school. And it may have been a good idea. You know, I just, I wanted to write fiction. I wanted to write a novel. And I went to a creative writing class shortly after moving to Florida. And another guy in the class was uh, an editor at a small beach newspaper. And he liked the way I wrote. And he said, come on over. We need someone on the society page. So I went over there. And they handed me a press release about a church social and said, write a story. So I wrote a story. They liked it. And the editor shook my hand and said, congratulations. Now you're a journalist. And I had a feeling there was more to it than that, but <laughs> and I was, I was right, because I thought, well, this is a great way to support myself while I write the great American novel, never realizing, you know, I was so naive that journalism is just a whirlwind that will swallow up your life, leaving you no time to even read the great American novel, much less write it. So I, I got my book writing started at a late date. We've heard a few of, of the rules that you live by as a, as a reporter. Describe the relationship that you had with the police in Miami? I mean, was it cooperative? Was it adversarial? Your role versus their role? It's really a love-hate relationship. A lot depends on what they're up to and what they did last. A lot depends on what you wrote last, what appeared under your byline last. Sometimes you show up at the police station and you think you're going to be welcomed with open arms because a story you wrote yesterday helped catch a fugitive or find a hit run driver or discover some stolen car that was important in a homicide case and you wind up getting the door slammed in your face because you never know. It could be political pressure. It could be pressure from the top. The assistant chief or some captain may be miffed that you used a detective's name in the story instead of his. And of course, the detective was out there and knew what was going on when he didn't. But it's a paramilitary organization, and so all the, the heat comes down the line. And so the detective suddenly slammed the door in your face, and you're not sure why, but they're getting pressured from above. Uh, there's a lot of police corruption. Uh, the idea that the police are this great brotherhood in blue, uh, the men behind the badge who stick together, really isn't quite true. Uh, a good detective told me once, and he was right, that when a policeman gets in trouble, the other cops run like thieves, and it's really true. And I think also that good policemen are elated when bad policemen are caught and get in trouble because they don't like these guys either. They don't want them backing them up. And we've had a lot of corruption in Miami. In fact, one of our former Miami police officers is still on the FBI most wanted list. Hmm. What happens um, when you put a woman into that society? Well, now it's pretty common. But back when I started, uh, there were very few women on the police beat, if any. And uh, at first, the police were sort of a little resistant, or they considered me you know, just this little airhead. And it took a while. And they used to try to do things to gross me out or to embarrass me. But then I, eventually, they realized that I was not on my way to some other market. I love Miami. It's the place where I want to stay forever. And I care about justice there. The people I care about live in Miami. And I care about justice as much as they do. And I'm going to keep coming back. I'm not going to go away. And if they don't help me get the story, I'll get it some other way. So they might as well cooperate. Be persistent and stay at it, another rule. Right. Well, it, it, it's, so, it's so interesting uh, that, that you stayed with this beat for so very long. A lot of reporters who are in the same beat for a long time end up really caught between becoming a pal with the people that they're covering, sort of becoming one of the boys 
um, and finding it harder and harder to do the kind of story that, that essentially bites the hand that feeds them. But, but you would still do that. Yeah, I had a lot of tough times with the police because I would write those stories. Sometimes reporters on a beat will cop out, and if they have to do an investigative piece on someone among their sources, like in the police department, they'd have another reporter come in to do it, like the good guy, bad guy thing. But I always wanted to do it myself, and I always told them it's better if I do it. You may be angry at me now, but somebody's going to write it, and aren't you more comfortable if I do, because at least I know you, I'll be fair, you'll get to tell your side. Uh, whenever a policeman got in trouble, I would go to their file and find the good things in their file to balance it out. Uh, you know, there's nobody better in the world than a good police officer and no worse creature in the world than a bad police officer. And often it's the same, often it's the same police officer on two different days or even the same day, just minutes apart. And so uh, they're only human. And so I would try to make sure that I was always fair. I wrote a story once that got some police officers arrested for rape and they went to jail. They lost their jobs, they were disgraced, they went to jail, and nothing is worse for a police officer than going to jail. Five minutes in jail is too long for a cop. And yet, one of them still from time to time calls me when he's drinking and depressed, and he says I was the only one that ever treated him fairly. You know, so we're sort of still friends. So you were married for a time to a cop. Right. How, did that affect your work at all? Was it awkward or difficult? Uh, not really, because it didn't last long enough. <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of... Uh, one of these things where I knew 24 hours later I had made a horrible mistake, and it took me a little longer to get out of it. But uh, and years later, he became the police chief in Miami Beach, and I was still covering the beat. So I went to see him, and I said, "Do you have any problem? Because if so, you know, with me covering this beat, because if so, the Herald can assign someone else." And he said, "No, I know you'll be fair, and uh, I have no problem with you, you know, writing the stories over here." And he was just chief there, I think, for another year or two. It never one, posed a problem. One of the lines in this book is. You call yourself a conscientious objector in the battle between the sexes. I wanted to know what that means. Well, you know, years ago, I just, I'm not really good at personal relationships. I was married twice briefly, and it finally occurred to me that I'm not good at that. I don't want to be a mommy. I'm not a superwoman type that can do it all, have a home and children and throw dinner parties and have a job and a career and write books and do all of these things and do them well. I really only have so much energy and I thought I should focus it on what I do best on the job. And that's what I've been doing for the last several years. And because men really only have just complicated my life or made me crazy or, <laughs> you know, so it's better, I seem to get more rewards from the job. <laughs> and also I think it's the fact that um, when I write these books, it takes about nine months to finish one. When I send it off to the publisher, it weighs about five and a half to six pounds, about the same as a baby. And you're sending it off into the world, you know, hoping that it will be well received and that someday perhaps it will send back some money. So I feel like these <laughs> books for my children I'm sending out there. And I don't really miss having all the rest because I really enjoy what I'm doing. Another of your rules, which you feel so strongly about that you repeat it three times whenever you, you talk about it, is never trust an editor, never trust an editor, never trust an editor. And that was certainly the rule when you worked in newspapers. As a, as a fiction writer, a novelist, do you, do you feel the same way about editors? I think I still do. You have to be very careful because I always said, just handing your story over to an editor and going home from the newspaper and forgetting about it is like sending your teenage daughter out on a date with Ted Bundy. I mean, you can't do it. You've got to constantly shepherd what you've done, your, your story, which has your byline on it and your reputation writing on it. And I think you have to be the same way with, with a book. You know, really mother hen it through, make sure nobody tampers with it too much, make sure they don't make grievous errors or put in errors or mistakes or chop out something good. Right now for my novel, which is coming out in September, Contents Under Pressure, uh, which I'm really excited about. I think I'm growing as a writer and it's the best thing I've ever done. I have a new wonderful woman editor that I really think is, is great. But of course, I haven't been working with her that long, so <laughs> I don't know. But you still, it, it's your product, you, you did it, and you're responsible for it. And you had to, you know, sh shield it from all these other outsiders who would tamper with it. You've been on, on sabbatical from the Miami Herald for a few years now. Are you, are you right. going to ever go back to being a daily beat reporter? I hope so, because I really miss it. I miss all that stimulation, the interaction with the, the creative, good people in the newsroom and the people out on the beat, the good guys, the bad guys, the sources, the cops. You know, that, that's really stimulating and fun. But, as I said, I've always wanted to write. And the thing I've discovered, you know, what I liked most of all about this book and about The Corpse Had a Familiar Face was I got a chance to write about all these heroes uh, 
who, you know, all their noble deeds and their adventures and put them between hard covers of a book that will be in libraries and on people's shelves and being read long after we're gone. In a way, it makes them immortal, and I loved that. But with fiction, I found something even more exciting and rewarding, and that's the fact that as writers, we love things to be tidy. We like to solve all their perplexing mysteries and wrap up the loose ends. And in real life and in journalism, that never happens. There are murders that are never solved, bodies that are never identified, missing people that are never found. But in fiction, you're in the driver's seat, and you can tie up those loose ends, solve the mysteries, and best of all, in the end, you can make the bad guys get what's coming to them and the good guys win, which in real life almost never happens. It's you mentioned that the, the heroes, and I, I just wanted to say for anyone who hasn't read the book, that the story of the Sutherland family alone uh, really demonstrates the range of people with whom you've, you've come in contact. I mean, you've met incredible villains and you've yeah. met wonderful, and wonderful heroes. And the Sutherland's among the bravest people I've ever met. And just, you know, you don't have to be a Rambo to be a hero. There are little old ladies and little kids and even animals. I have some animal heroes in the, in the book. So it's, it's a joy to meet people like that, and it really restores your faith in, in human beings. It might be hard for people to understand how you retain that kind of optimism, given everything you've seen. Well, it's because, as I said before, we can help make things happen, we can help make things better, and also we can help make these people, we can get, have the heroes recognized, because so many of them go unsung and unrecognized, and we can also uh, make you know, speak for the dead and make them human and not statistics, because that's one of the things that's wrong with our system. You know, the villains of the piece, they wind up in court in front of judges and juries, human beings like themselves, who can relate to him. He can even shed a tear at the right moment. And the victims are names and numbers on pieces of paper. And I think that dehumanizes all of us to have them just statistics. Well, the victims are, are much, much more in this book. Again, the name of the book, Never Let Them See You Cry, the writer Edna Buchanan. And thank you so much for being a guest on Upon Reflection. Thank you. You make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.